they, it caused such a stir that the television camera tr crews actually sent cameras out to talk to Rick Sinnott, uh, the local fish and game agent, a guy I actually went to college with in Fairbanks. And they explained the situation to him and what were we going to do about these moose. <coughs> and this guy had built a six-foot fence around his yard and, you know, how were we going to fix this? And Rick, he sort of looked off into the distance and he said, you know, he said, the only thing a six-foot fence is good for is for the moose to lean its chin on while it decides which of its trees it's going to eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you pointed out to me when we were talking, I think it's about your fifth book once, Play With Fire, and I've always remembered this remark because it is one in which um, the radical right and the radical left mm -hmm. are both represented. And, and you said that to me, you know, that it's a frontier state and yes. it attracts all sorts of extremists as a consequence. Yes. People who want to get away from it all, people who want to rough it, people whose, I suppose it's not all that different from the same thing that brought the pilgrims over in the first place to escape. It's uh, very similar, I think. It is. We get a lot of people from, uh, we get people who want to, you know, who have a very Rousseau vision of the wilderness and they're going to move into it and get back to nature. and have no survival skills whatsoever and no woodscraft whatsoever and really don't know what they're doing and where it may be said they almost immediately die. And then we have people who are going to move as far away from authority as they can possibly get, including one wonderful friend of my father's who has a house way, way out in the bush somewhere south of Denali National Park who is absolutely convinced that there are signs printed in invisible ink on the back of all the highway signs in the state directing the invading United Nations troops when they come to invade on the behalf of the Trilateral Commission. <laughs> so we get all kinds. <laughs> yes, they think they can get away from it all there until yes. a moose kicks them in the head or a bear eats them. <laughs> Well, you're not as isolated as you were, certainly, before the advent of the personal computer and email. And cable. Let's not forget cable television. Satellite okay. television, I probably should say. Which is one way, of course, that you and I keep in frequent yes. touch. Mm -hmm. So here you are in Alaska when it was less accessible, and you started writing. And if I remember right, it was science fiction that was your first, your maiden voyage, so to speak. Well, actually, I, I was, at the time, working on... A, the Great Alaskan Novel, as I so fondly refer to it now, uh, which is at this point about 775 pages and counting, and, and if God is good, it will never <laughs> see the light of publishing day. It's the book that tra taught me to write, really. It was my master's thesis. Um, and to go back even a little bit further, the first television I ever saw was in 1969, and the first live broadcast I ever saw was The Landing on the Moon. And I was a huge fan of the space program, but I have no background in the hard sciences, so I didn't think I was ever going to be, you know, apt enough to write science fiction. Well, I followed the science, the, the, the space program avidly, and then in the shuttle blew up, and I was furious. I was mm. especially furious after uh, Richard Feynman did the little demonstration with the O-ring and the glass of ice water and demonstrated that, in fact, this was an accident that, yes, could have been avoided. There were people right there on the ground telling them not to launch. And I discovered that rage was a great motiv motivator because I sat down and I wrote a story about a space program that worked. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my, and then to my great astonishment, sold the book. <laughs> how, much science, what, how many science fiction were they all books? Were some of them short stories? I'm not familiar no. with this part of your uh, yeah. oeuvre. No, I, um, the first two books I sold, uh, Second Star and A Handful of Stars, were science fiction. And then I sold a third, and it was printed, I think it was 1995, the same year as Play With Fire, called Red Planet Run. Are they all still in print? Uh, I don't know. I've tried to find out, and nobody wants to tell me. I think every time I call New York to ask them if they're still in print, they're, everybody's hair goes you know, straight up at the thought that I might get the rights back, and so they print five more, so they can say that they're still in print. You can still find them, as I understand it. You can still find them new. Wonderful. Well, what is it that then um, got you to try the mystery as a form? Well, I never, I never read the same thing that I'm writing because it's too much like work, so I was writing science fiction. I was finishing up A Handful of Stars, the second star book, and um, reading mysteries. Reading, it's the first time really that I've read so many mysteries all at once. I was reading, and the good ones too, I was reading P.D. James and Sarah Paretsky and Sue Grafton. I mean, the, and I thought to myself, God, you know, gee, I wonder if I can write one of these. I mean, really, it was like, I wonder if I can write one of these. You know, oh, God, there was no master plan to this whatsoever, Barbara, I'm sorry to say. And so I put, I finished A Handful of Stars and I got it in and I sat down and 
Oh, I had just visited my aunt in Long Lake, which is about 25 miles from McCarthy, which is in the middle of the Wrangell State Alliance Park. So the area was very fresh in my mind. And I thought, okay, I'll set it there. And I peopled it with some of the characters that my aunt had introduced me to and decided that I was going to have a, a protagonist named, uh, an Aleut protagonist, because I was raised with Aleuts. And this was totally the lazy woman's way of writing a book. You know, I wasn't going to look anything up. I was going to write it all from my own memory and the Alaska Almanac Book of Facts. That was my, those were my two resources. That was it. That was all I was going to do. So I wrote what eventually became A Cold Day for Murder, which at that time was imaginatively titled Mystery. This was in 1987. I copied it off the hard disk drive onto a floppy, which I tossed into a box, which was then stored in my father's garage for two years. <laughs> for heaven's sake, I thought it winged from you straight to no. New York. <laughs> no. Yeah. Along about the, uh, okay, about the end of 89, the beginning of 90 is when I sold my first science fiction book. And uh, about a year after that, I just mentioned in passing to my editor that, in fact, yes, I had written this mystery. Oh, she said. It hadn't even occurred to me to give it to her because she was a science fiction editor. And I said this mm. to her, are you, are you sure? I was, such, I was so innocent, <laughs> I truly was. <laughs> so I sent it off to her and the rest was pretty much history. <laughs> well, it certainly um, <laughs> was a remarkable history because as I recall, you and I met for the very first time as you and Ginny Hartzberg and I actually <laughs> met for the very first time in the ladies' restroom <laughs> at the Shirt in New York during the Edgar Allan Poe Awards ceremony. Yes, yes. You and Ginny were both nominees for the best paperback original novel mm -hmm. of 1993. Mm -hmm. And there I was, <laughs> hoping it would be a tie. <laughs> so I'm so fond of both of you and really enjoyed your books. But in fact, you prevailed and went yes. home with that little funky statue of Mr. Poe. And he, he looks like he's mm -hmm. just shot up with cocaine or something. <laughs> Uh, sort of like that. It is the cheesiest little <laughs> statue you ever saw in your life. Yeah, I almost missed the Edgar Awards. Did you know that? No. Oh, yes, yes. Kathy flew, flew down, Kathy, my adopted sister, mm -hmm. flew down to, the, to be my Edgar date. And we had to go to that signing, what was that, big bookstore on Brentano's, all the, all the Edgar nominees had to go. Oh, right. Brent, they usually set Avenue. that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was 2 o'clock when we came out of the store, and the sun was shining. There was a nice little breeze blowing, and we didn't have to be back to the hotel till 5.30. So we thought, we looked at each other, and with one voice we said, oh, Statue of Liberty, because neither one of us had been to New York before. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so we grabbed a cab, and we went down to Battery Park, and we took a ferry to the Statue of Liberty and had a marvelous time, and got back in what we thought was plenty of time to get back to the Sheridan, New York. Unfortunately, we stepped ashore at Battery Park right around 4.05 p.m. Oops. And Wall Street gets out at about 4 o'clock, and there was not a cab to be seen or heard. And even then, when, even when we would manage to see a cab and wave it down, they'd ask us where we were going, you know. And so we'd tell them, Sheridan, New York. Nah, they'd say, and drive on. <laughs> it's getting on toward 5 o'clock, and I'm, I've... I've I've just, we don't know how to take subways. We wouldn't even know subway station, what it looked like if we'd saw, seen one. So I, I, had, I was mentally composing apologies to my agent, to my editor, to my publisher, to everyone, to the entire Edgar nominating committee, everyone. I was so sorry. I just, I was, that's all, I, was just, I had given up. Kathy spotted a cab roaring by at the usual New York speed of about 103 miles per hour. She leaped out in front of it, really, literally, and held her hands out like this and made them stop. You should have seen these two guys in the front seat of this car. They were so scared. <laughs> <laughs> these two wild women from Alaska. <laughs> and she marched over to the driver's side and she said, we are going to the Sheridan, New York, and you are taking us. And she got around and got in the back and sat down and shut the, shut the door and just sat there. I'm standing on the curb like this. And she looked over and saw me standing there. She said, get in! <laughs> <So> <laughs> We got in. <laughs> awesome. And we made it like five, 25 minutes after five. We find we're walking down the hall toward our room, taking our clothes off, undressing as we're walking down the hall to get to the room so we can get to the cocktail party at 5.30 where my editor and agent are waiting for me. Isn't that, you know, that's a lovely form of innocence. If, if in Alaska, you would never, ever try to get from, <laughs> like, you know, Fairbanks to Anchorage in a day or something, yeah. and there you are in Manhattan, and you think, oh, well, what's the big deal? You know, it's just a city. That's what took a cab. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And it seems so. I had a New York publicist call one time, I've never forgotten, and said she was setting up um, a tour for somebody, and would it be all right if this person signed in Houston for lunch? then made it to Albuquerque and could do an evening program for us. <laughs> and I said, I don't think that'll work. And she said, why not? And I said, there's too much distance involved. And she said, but they look so close. <laughs> <laughs>